Hi everyone, I'm Lucy Fernandez and I'm a, a demo chemist in the European Demo Lab. So today I'm going to take you through the, the workflow for peptide MAM. So if I just share my screen with you. Okay, so what you can see here is the, the Waters Connect Hub. So this is um, the, the, the new in environment um, in which we have all the applications for things like peptide MAM and things like the sample submission and the acquisition method editor. And we also have the Unify app, which contains all the, the functionality that we have in Unify. So today I'm going to show you the peptide MAM complete workflow. So before I show you the workflow from start to finish, I'm going to quickly show you what the, the results look like for a peptide MAM experiment. So this is basically the overview of the monitored attributes. So I'm going to go through again this from start to finish in a minute, but just so you can kind of see the, the main result um, at the start. This experiment is monitoring six attributes and it's in a NIST triptych digest. So it's only a small sample set and it's really just to, to kind of use it to demonstrate the key features of the peptide MAM workflow. So there's, there's four samples of NIST digest and samples two and four have been stressed and one and, and three are, are control samples. So out of the the six monitored attributes here, we have some methionine oxidation, some deamidation, um, a glycosylation and an N-terminal pyroglutamination. So you can see here um, the, the, the six bar charts are showing the percentage modification for each sample for the particular um, attributes. And also we have indication of the level um, that we, we accept or is the acceptable range. And we can see instantly if a particular sample has exceeded the or is out, outside the acceptable range of that particular attribute. And this, this range is, is, um, is stated in the method. So you basically just put in what your acceptable range is when you're setting up the method. And then once that's in, basically anything that, that is, is over um, or outside the acceptable range will, will be flagged up. So this is just a nice kind of overview of the results from the, the monitored attributes review. We'll look in a little bit more detail in a minute. Another quick thing I want to show you is the results from the new peat detection. Okay, so the new peat detection functionality is a really nice way of identifying anything that's new or is basically um, is, is different, is, is a fold change in um, between samples. So um, we have a new peak detection control sample, which is specified in the method. And then the other unknown samples are compared against the new peak detection control. So as you saw before, we have four samples in this set. And sample one, is stressed and sample um, three is stressed, but sample two is the control sample and we spiked in 15 peptides. And the reason we've done this, it's, it's, it's another control if you like, is so that we can tune the new peat detection parameters to pick out these 15 peptides. Okay, so once once we, we can see we've identified 15 peptides, we, we can be confident then that the detection criteria is, is, is has been set right. So we use the de detection criteria. There's, there's five um, criteria there. And this is to, to make sure that we don't have to review too many false positives. So it looks at things like the, um, the, the fold change, the percentage of base peak, but also we have this isotopic similarity um, setting, which gives an indication that it is actually a peptide that we're looking at. So it takes the, um, the mass of the, the peptide and it compares that with an average gene peptide and the isotopic profile. And it will then use the, the score of 75, to, which is basically industry standard 
uh, for this parameter and it means that the new peak that's being flagged up is likely to be a peptide because of this isotope um, similarity score. So again, that adds a new peak detection um, step and we'll look a little bit more closely in the review of that um, in, in a few minutes. But one, once I've, um, now that I've shown you these kind of two features of, of the workflow, I want to kind of start from, from the beginning now and just take you through how you actually set up um, the workflow. So this is the, the welcome to the peptide MAM um, page. And you can see here that you can create an analysis and also create a processing method. So um, the first thing we're going to look at is, is, the, is the processing method. So you can see here that I've already created a method um, for the NIST, the NIST peptide MAM. So if we just open that, you can see that we, we have um, three steps to creating a method. So the first step is to actually define the attributes, to so define the peptides uh, and the modifications that we want to monitor. So you can see here we, we have um, six or seven in this, in this method. And if you just have a look, if I go to edit one of them, we can see here that we have the, the unmodified form of the peptide. We've ticked that you want to monitor the modified form. We've given it a name and we've set the acceptable limits. The acceptable limits can be less than, greater than or between. And we just literally type in what value you want to have that threshold at. OK, so that's basically what it looks like. So to bring in the, um, the attributes, this is done from the peptide map experiment. So if it's done in Unify, then you can automatically create a library of the attributes that you define your peptide mapping experiments. And once that's in the Unify library, you can then import it into here. So if you're not using um, a, a Unify um, workflow for peptide mapping, you can also bring in the attributes from a CSV file. OK, but we're going to use a scientific library because we're, we've done everything in Unify in this example. So if I bring in um, this library here, we can see we have lots of peptides um, that have been brought in. So we can either select the whole list here and bring them all in. So I'll do that. I'll, I'll import them in here. So we're not actually bringing them into the method just yet. We're just bringing them into this table. And now we will go on and actually select what we want to use to create an attribute. OK, so I'm going to select all the different instances of the glycosylated peptide on the NIST antibody. So I'm selecting all the, the instances of that peptide and saying create attributes. OK, so it's brought all the things that we want to consider now into this create monitored attribute part. And for example, we can select one of the, the glycoforms. So we can select um, G. G1F, so we can give it a name. Okay, you can call it whatever you like, you can type the sequence in, um, tally up to you. And we're going to say we want that to be greater than 10%. Okay, then we recreate that. Okay, so this is basically what we just created. So you can see here it's now in the list. So another useful thing, um, we can actually copy that. So if you want to monitor a different like a form, um, for example, I think one I haven't done yet is, is this one here. We can basically just edit what we currently have. OK, and then you might want that to be less than something. OK, so you just have that you have the flexibility to, you know, kind of bring in attributes directly from from this table, from the library. And then also you have the ability to edit and copy and remove them from the list. So it's, it's really easy to create these attributes. And I think you could also see, for example, if I look at if one of these, um, we can define the, the charge states you want to look at as well. So this is automatically brought in from Unify. OK, but you have some control there of what charge states um, you look at. 
Okay, so that's bringing in the attributes. Another thing we have is, is we have a system suitability test um, part of this workflow. And what that allows you to do, it allows you to use um, your SST samples to monitor the, the status of the instrument. So, for example, if you want to make sure that the mass accuracy um, and the, the response and the intensity of, of these peaks were the same uh, across the run. So, for example, you weren't losing any uh, instrument performance across the run. This is a really good way to monitor the instruments. OK, that this way you can be sure that any variability within your unknown samples is down to the samples and not the, the, the instruments. OK, so what we do here, again, we, we import um, a, a CSV file that has all this information in, but it's basically just um, what we want to, to monitor for the system suitability test. OK, and this is basically just a list of seven peptides from a mass prep mix. And basically, you put in the, the mass, the retention time, and we have pass fail criteria. Um, so, for example, you specify what the, the mass error tolerance would, would be, um, retention time tolerance, and also peak width and in intensity min and max values. OK, so this just allows you to then have a quick pass fail criteria on these samples. So again, it's really easy to see if anything is, you know, is, is kind of um, going um, wrong with the instrument through the run or something that you might need to just check. So the last stage in the method is the processing parameters. So again, not, not too much to set up here. It's basically just your uh, mass tolerance, retention time tolerance. Um, this peak processing um, kind of window is a good thing to use. It allows you to ignore ions before a certain part of the gradient and then ignore the ions after. So you're just concentrating on, on the part of the, um, the gradient that has, has the peaks of interest. And again, this makes the, the processing more efficient as well. And then um, you remember I showed you the new peak detection in the results before. This is where you set up the, the criteria for the new peak detection. However, this is something that can be also tweaked after the sample run is processed. You don't need to go back to the method and change the new peak detection criteria. You can kind of tune that um, and tweak it after the, after the batch has been run. So that's the method. So once, once the method's um, being created, I can now show you how we set up a acquire and process run. OK, so there's, there's a couple of um, options when we're setting up a new analysis. We can set it up to acquire the samples and process them, or we can process, process existing data OK, and bring in, um, for example, unified data that you want to process. But in this workflow, um, I'm going to set it up to acquire the samples as well. So if I just look at um, something that I've created already. So this is the start of, of setting up the acquire and process analysis. So the first thing we have to do is specify the method. So um, basically, you just browse in um, a method from, from the folder. And this is, is one that's very similar to the method I just showed you. You then it gives you a little um, summary there of what's in the method. So you can see the all the different parameters, the SSTs and the attributes. And you select that method that you want to use. And then when you're ready, you go into acquire and process and sample submission. So it now takes you through to so the other Waters Connect app in sample submission. OK, so now we can browse our sample list. OK, so this contains basically the, the samples one you want to inject. So we've got the blanks, we've got the system suitability um, samples that I mentioned earlier. So you run three system suitability samples, then another blank, and then these are the this is the control sample and the three unknown samples that form the um, the actual um, MAM analysis. Okay, so you see just the standard information there. We've got sample type, injection volume, sample position, and replicates. Uh, we have to specify a new peak detection reference. 
which is, is like I explained earlier, um, we'll, we'll use that sample to then <clears throat> look for, for any new or additional or, or different peaks. And then we have the retention time alignment reference. And that's just something that's going to allow data. So it should be something <clears throat> representative. So it should be a real sample and it should be in around the middle of the run. OK, so on the left here, we can interact with the system. So you can see our, our LCMS system is green. It's ready to use. We can set to initial conditions. So we've set the flow rate and the column temperature. Um, we can stop the flow and we can reset the system. OK, so we have some options there. And then here we can go into the acquisition method editor, which again is another app in Waters Connect. And we can see here that we have parameters for the um, the, the BSM, um, the sample manager, the column settings and the, the mass spectrometer. So here you can see we have all the mass spec parameters um, for a full scan of fragmentation acquisition, which is the, the standard peptide um, acquisition that, that we use. OK, so we, we can edit the, the method in here or we can browse in another method. OK, so it's all, all done again from the, the Waters Connect app environment. OK, so if we go back to sample submission. So um, we're going to start this off now. So we just select the samples that you want to run. And then hit submit. OK, so the job's now been successfully submitted and we can go to the queue. And we can see that it's queued up. So once the actual um, samples are injected, um, we'll also get real time data as well. So the chromatograms, once everything kicks in, would, would appear there. So you can get a feel for your live acquisition as well. OK, so um, if we go back to the peptide MAM now, um, if I just open another window, if we now go back to that same analysis that we, we just created uh, and open it, you can see that it's now waiting for the injections. OK, so once all those injections have been acquired and processed, then these additional steps will will be active. So we, we, can, we can pretend that that's happened. So we can go back to the one that I showed you earlier. So and we pick it up from from the first step after processing. This is basically the first thing that, that you will that you will see. And it's the data from the system suitability test. Um, so you can see here it is plotted the injections um, according to things like mass error, retention time error, standardized intensity and peak width. So again, this just gives you a nice um, visual overview of your SSTs. And also look in the, in the chromatogram um, view as well. So everything's passed here. So we have the six SST samples. Uh, so you can click on any of them. And if anything could have failed based on the, the criteria we set up in, in the method, it would appear as a red cross. So you would know instantly um, if, if something had failed. Yeah, so again, you can look at the, um, the, the TIC and the BPI as well, as well as checking all the, um, all the past failed criteria. OK, and every, everything is passed here and it's all um, within the, the limits that were set up in the method. So once you've checked the SST samples, we can look at the data from the injections. Again, uh, if you look at one of the, the NIST digests, we can toggle, toggle between TIC and BPI and UV. OK, so we can see the, the nice um, data there. So that's just a, a, a you know a, a, an opportunity to actually look at look at the the chromatograms. If you look in the retention time alignments, um, here we can see what the sample looks like before and after uh, alignment. Um, so, for example, since strange happening in the view here, uh, but we can just see that yeah, before um, alignment and after alignment, there has been a um, a slight adjustment there. Okay, so we're gonna get to the, the monitored attributes um, step now, which is, is, is where I kind of showed you uh, initially. Um, so yeah, so it, it gives you a nice overview of the, the monitored attributes. You can see what's, uh, what's kind of outside the acceptable range really easily. So once you've um, seen that, you can then delve a little bit deeper into the acceptable ranges. So we can see here, for example, um, 
in one of the oxidized methionines. If I look at the, the injection um, for something that's exceeded that range, we can see here that we're looking at the, um, the unmodified form at the moment. But if we look at the, the actual modified form, and it tells us here on the right which one we're actually monitoring, we can just see here that we do have, you know, kind of nice um, data, nice mass spec data. We've got the extracted iron chromatogram for the, the two plus charge date. And we can see there, you know, that it is, um, it is, is good data. You can zoom in and just check the, the isotopic profile um, and things like that. So it's nice that you can kind of just go in there and, and look at the data, look at the integration. Um, I'll just pick another example quickly. Again, if we look at the monitored attributes, yeah, again, so you see it's 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 less intense this peak, um, but we can still see that it's it's a nice um the spectral data it is good and we've got data for the three plus and the two plus charge states here. Okay, so we can detect things down to a, a low level. Okay, so I'm going to look at the new peak detection again. So I did explain a little bit about this before. So um, sample unknown sample two is the control sample plus 15 spiked peptides. And we've done that so that we know now that these um, parameters, the detection criteria has, has been set um, correctly. So we know now that if we look, for example, at, at one of the stress samples, um, so we'll know sample one is, is a stress sample. And if I change that here, um, we, we get the chance now to go in and we can we can start to review <clears throat> some of these new peaks. So you see we have 29 new peaks here, okay, which isn't a, a, a vast number to review. It's a manageable number. So we go in each one. So I've already done sample one. So we go in and review the next one here. Again, you can just look at things like the um, the, the the chromatogram and the the data and <clears throat> excuse me, basically just um, you know visually inspect the data and say if if you want to confirm it as a new peak or if it looks a bit scratchy, if it doesn't look like it's real, then you, you can reject it. So I say I want to confirm that. Um, and then it will allow us to go on to the next peak in the in the list or back to the the table. Um, but yeah, you can just go through each um, peak um, and say whether you're going to accept it or reject it. And the nice thing about having this kind of intelligent criteria and the algorithms around it is it just means that the number of false positives that will be picked up as new peaks is kept to a minimum. Okay, so you can tune the parameters to make sure you're not having to look at hundreds of potential new peaks. OK, so it's, it's a nice manageable number and you have control over how stringent you want to be with those um, criteria. OK, so that's the, the new peak detection. Um, the last thing I want to show you quickly is just the report. So it's quite simple. You have a list of things that you can include in the report. There are six things here that you can either tick or, or untick. OK, and basically, once you're happy with everything that's in there, you basically just click generate report and it brings back a, a nice um, report with all the things that you that you want to be in there. OK, so you can see here you've got the SSTs and then if we scroll down um, to the monitored attributes, we get a nice list of, of the, the monitored attributes and an indication of what the criteria was. So you can see here we've got a nice summary table with the um, the six different attributes across all the samples. OK. So that is the, the workflow for Peptide MAM. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much.